Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this symposium. I, I always enjoy visiting Portugal. Uh, we had wonderful evening yesterday in the old city, uh, listening to Fado. The weather was great. Well, it's not so great today, but maybe it's good for we can all be here and listen to the talks. Uh, so, yeah, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, my work, you know, and fascination has been understanding mechanisms uh, of cancer resistance that evolved uh, uh, in various animals, uh, because from there we can uh, derive understanding on how to treat and prevent cancer, uh, from, because evolution had a long time uh, to create various species with very different disease susceptibilities, and this is a source for us to learn from. Okay, so I will go quickly through my disclosures, and yeah, none of it is related much to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so here is, uh, you know, to emphasize this point about evolution, um, we have species, even just limiting ourselves to mammals, uh, that differ up to 100-fold in maximum lifespan, uh, and longevity goes together hand in hand with cancer resistance because to live for so many years, uh, species should not develop cancer very quickly. Um, majority of mice, by the time they are two or three years old, already develop tumors, uh, and uh, you know, up to 80% of laboratory mice dies fr die from cancer at this age, uh, while many other species continue living for many, many years. Uh, one animal I'm going to talk about today, oh, sorry, uh, is the naked mole rat uh, that, well, this number has recently been updated, so the maximum lifespan is over 40 years right now. So it's 10 times longer than the mouse lifespan, and they almost never develop cancer. There were maybe just uh, five or six cases reported in the literature. Um, and th there are many other species very... Uh, interesting, I'm also going to talk about the bowhead whale, uh, which is the longest-lived mammal on Earth. It lives more than 200 years, uh, and it is also exceptionally large, and you will see why that is also very relevant uh, to cancer resistance. Uh, so some uh, number of years ago, we described the mechanisms uh, that control evolution of tumor suppressors depending on species lifespan and body mass. Uh, so to quickly go over this, uh, what we found was that um, a species that are larger than about 10 kilograms of body mass, uh, they uh, show um, you know, more sophisticated anti-cancer defenses, and the humans belong into this group. Yeah, we are larger than 10 kilograms. Uh, this includes repression of somatic telomerase activity, replicative senescence that happens through telomere shortening, uh, and the overall some you know, additional protections from cancer that are necessitated uh, by having larger body size, because uh, larger body means larger number of cells, and then from stochastic nature of cancer, you would statistically expect larger species to be more prone to cancer, but in fact they are not. Uh, because they have those additional um, defenses. Uh, then we have small and short-lived species, like our laboratory mice and rats, uh, that have fewer tumor-suppressive barriers. Uh, they do not use replicative senescence. Their telom telomerase is active all the time, and they, in general, have pretty long telomeres. Uh, and then there is this third group, very interesting, that didn't receive much attention before. These are small-bodied species, uh, like naked mora, that are very long-lived, um, and the, their cancer risk is also statistically elevated because they live longer, uh, but at the same time, they evolve different mechanisms of tumor suppression. Uh, they do not restrict telomerase activity because for them it doesn't really make sense, and I will say in a minute why. Um, so they evolve additional tumor suppressors that are telomere independent, and the reason why they don't rely on replicative senescence is that um, for a tumor to run out of telomeres, it takes several, you know, number of cell division, the tumor would grow to a small size, maybe one gram or so, uh, and in large animals like humans, there are many such benign growth that can be found, you know, if you do whole body scan. Uh, and for a human, the 
typically inconsequential uh, because compared to our body mass, that would be very small. Uh, so it, it doesn't block a critical organ, that's fine. Uh, but for a mouse, a tumor of this size would be a real issue. Uh, and this is why they rely on early acting tumor suppressors. Now, with this introduction, I want to uh, move on into the story of Nikid Mora that was developed by these two very talented graduate students in my group, Xiao Tian and Jihui Zhang. Uh, so we published in 2013 this paper where we addressed mechanisms of cancer resistance uh, of the naked morat, and we found that in large part it was explained by very unique extracellular matrix in the naked morat that contained uh, very large quantities of hyaluronic acid. Uh, our extracellular matrix also contains hyaluronic acid, but about 10 times less, uh, and also the molecule of hyaluronin uh, in human and most other species is much shorter. So this is what we uh, discovered, uh, that hyaluronin restricts cell proliferation at early stages of malignant transformation, and that's what gives naked morats their cancer resistance, or at least it's one of the mechanisms. Uh, now to new data that's you know, still under review, what we were interested to, to learn uh, if we can make naked morat cells more prone to malignant transformation by knocking down hyaluronin synthesis, and that's what we demonstrated in that 2013 publication. Uh, we were interested if we can uh, you know, do the opposite uh, and make mice produce more hyaluronin. Will they become more like naked morat? Will they be more resistant to cancer? And that would suggest that this mechanism can be um, translated into humans, potentially, like proof of principle. Uh, so we generated transgenic mice uh, expressing naked morat gene for hyaluronin synthesis, uh, and we started characterizing them. Uh, so first of all, we found that in these mice, uh, spontaneous tumor incidence was reduced, and especially in the old age, they had significantly fewer tu spontaneous tumors. Uh, then when we tried to induce tumor using uh, dmb ATPA skin carcinogenesis. Uh, we also observed a very significant difference. So these are our control mice, and these are transgenic. They develop fewer papillomas. So they didn't become exactly like naked morats. They would still get tumors, but the frequency was much reduced. Uh, now, you know, even more interesting, when we looked at the lifespan of these mice, they lived longer. Uh, and the, so this is other biomarkers of age, like methylation aging, was reduced. Uh, and they also showed reduced frailty. So the frailty score for mice is very similar to geriatric frailty score. Uh, you know, it's walking speed, grip strength, and things like that. So they had reduced frailty. Uh, they showed improved physical performance in general. So it benefited mice not only with cancer, but also for longevity, which was quite exciting. Uh, and uh, we wanted to understand the mechanism because we couldn't explain everything through um, cancer suppression so because there were effects beyond that. Uh, and when we look, analyzed transcriptomes of these mice, we found that uh, you know, many genes go up with age, uh, but when we compare transgenic mice, uh, these ones, to the controls, there was a huge difference in induction of different inflammation pathways. So mice expressing naked more at hyaluronin synthesis were much less inflamed in old age. And this may be the key beyond, you know, behind the longevity and uh, improved health span. Uh, so here is the summary for this first part of my talk, uh, where we took uh, this mechanism that evolved in the naked mole rat, we introduced it into mouse, and we found that it benefits uh, by reducing inflammation, it reduces cancer, and the mice were living longer. So now let me switch to the second part of my talk, uh, which is all completely new data. Uh, and I will talk about the largest animal, I mean, one of the largest and the longest lived mammals on Earth, the bowhead whale, or Arctic whale. Uh, these whales live in the Arctic, as the name suggests also. Uh, they are extremely large, so you may be wondering where the number 211 came from. Well, in general, they can survive more than 200 years, but there was one whale uh, that was captured, and it still had a harpoon fragment 
uh, lodged in its tissue and there was a date on it so people could get such a precise number. But uh, many other whales were aged, you know, based on uh, amino acid racemization in their eyes. Uh, so we are quite confident that they did live that long. Now, you know, what makes this animal interesting is also its size. As I mentioned, um, there is this concept called Petus paradox that species that are so large don't actually develop cancer very frequently, so they must have defenses. Uh, this issue was studied previously in elephants, and you maybe read those, there were a couple of high-profile papers published um, claiming that elephants have multiple copies of P53 gene uh, that increases their sensitivity, susceptibility to apoptosis. They kill their cells very easily, and this is what allows them to avoid cancer. So this is a you know, very exciting observation, although it leaves many questions unanswered, because if uh, elephants are so quick to uh, kill their cells by apoptosis, uh, so then you know, how come they can survive long enough because you can run out of cells? And such examples exist, for example, with mice overexpressing, uh, having hyperactive P53. Some of them display premature aging, but perhaps elephant uh, evolved also some compensatory mechanisms. Uh, but we were interested if whale does anything similar, because compared to whale, elephant is a tiny animal. Um, and so my students traveled to Alaska, and uh, uh, we collaborated with uh, local communities to collect samples from uh, bowhead whales. And this is the work of Dennis Fersanov and Mark Zakir, and they were also helped. Uh, by bioinformatician Yu Yang Lu and uh, proteomics expert Greg Tombline. Uh, so once we obtained those primary fibroblasts from whale, uh, the first question we measured P53 activity because we thought, are they the same as elephants? Uh, and to our surprise, uh, well, they were not. We didn't see elevated P53 activity in the whale. Uh, if anything, it was lower than in human and a couple other species that we compare whale to. Well, cow is one of its closer uh, land relatives. That's why we used cow and also mouse. And also genome analysis didn't reveal additional copies of P53s in the whale. So they must be using a different strategy than elephants. And then we decided to find out how many oncogenic hits are required for malignant transformation of whale cells. Uh, from classical Bob Weinberg studies, we know that for human fibroblast, we need to introduce five mutational hits, uh, while for a mouse, uh, only two hits is required. So what for the whale? And initially, we expected that uh, we would need, uh, you know, maybe five or six or seven. Uh, but to our surprise, uh, Oh, just one more point. Uh, we also looked at senescence in the whale. Uh, and here, according to our original model, we observed replicative senescence because whale is large, uh, telomere shortening. And also, when we analyze senescence response in the whale, uh, this is so-called SASP phenotype. Uh, that is characterized by expression of various pro-inflammatory cytokines, it was much attenuated in the whale, so their SASP is less inflammatory, which may help their longer lifespan. Uh, but now back to tumor suppressors. Uh, so we started mutating uh, tumor suppressors. In the whale, we've done it with large T antigen, and also we've done the exact same panel using CRISPR targeting specific genes as well. Uh, so, okay, if we mutate RAS and inactivate P53, there were no tumors. We inactivate RB, there was a little bit of growth in soft agar, but not in the mouse. Now, if we inactivate both RB and P53, we got tumors in the mouse, and we were very surprised because that means only four oncogenic hits, so it's a one less than in human. If we introduce the fifth hit, the tumors grew even faster, uh, but still, um, you know, even this was enough and there were quite sizable tumors. Uh, so that was really not what we expected uh, because that means bowhead whale did not evolve additional uh, tumor suppressor of this barrier type, uh, gatekeeper type like RB or P53. Uh, there were only four hits required to transform whale fibroblast. And then the question, okay, how come they don't get tumors, you know, when they grow to this size? 
Uh, and then we started thinking about it because uh, these tumor suppressors uh, are gatekeepers. Uh, so when cells have already accumulated pro-tumorogenic mutations, uh, these genes are important to either reduce apoptosis or senescence. Uh, but if, for example, whale has superior genome maintenance and never or very rarely accumulates those mutations, then maybe we don't need as many tumor suppressors of this type. So we decided to look at DNA repair in the whale. Uh, so we analyzed here base excision and nucleotide excision repair. We compared whale to human. Uh, and this is a, a tough comparison. Human are really, we are very good at DNA repair. If we uh, included mouse, it would have been like here. Uh, but whale was, uh, you know, same as human, maybe a little bit better, but it was not, you know, very dramatic difference. Uh, so then we looked at double strand break repair, uh, specifically by non homologous end joining. And here that we were up for a surprise, there was a, uh, you know, a very large difference between both and whales' ability to repair double strand breaks. Uh, and we've done it using these reporters. Also here, a different assay where we look at micronuclear formation. Again, whale was much more efficient than human. Uh, and uh, during non homologous end joining, the two ends of DNA are joined, and that frequently results in mutation, uh, deletion or insertion at the end. Uh, and here we compare this mutational uh, spectrum between human and whale. Uh, so all the pink would be a deletion. Uh, and you can see a huge difference. Whale was much more accurate at joining DNA ends. Uh, and also here we compare all the four species. Uh, and again, you see whale looks so different from the other three. Uh, there are very few deletions. They're mostly precise events. So indeed, whale is much better at maintaining its DNA. So now the question is, okay, how they do it? Uh, so we've done proteomics on the whale, analyzed various DNA repair proteins that showed difference between human and whale, and then confirmed them by Western blood. So here is the result. The most dramatic difference was uh, this protein called KIRB, uh, which stands for cold induced RNA binding protein. It was present in the whale like 100 fold excess uh, relative to other species. Uh, there were also some interesting differences, PARP. One was elevated at RPA2. Uh, so here we, th we decided, okay, let's test them all. Uh, we took uh, KIRB from bowhead whale and we overexpressed it in human cells and repeated DNA repair assay that I showed you before. Uh, and it resulted in improvement of DNA repair. So here by just expressing one protein, we could enhance uh, about twofold DNA repair in human cells, and here both by end joining and homologous recombination pathways. So what is KIRB doing? Uh, it has a function uh, in controlling splicing and uh, uh, RNA uh, sort of homeostasis in response to cold, but it has also a moonlighting function in the nucleus uh, where uh, it comes to double strand breaks and it binds PAR uh, when PARP1 is activated and it helps uh, recruit other factors to DNA breaks. And interestingly, PARP1 was also enhanced in the whale. So then we tried another experiment. I thought, okay, here we took bowhead whale protein, we put it in humans, it's kind of a gene therapy approach. Can we induce our own uh, KIRP to do the same? So we took human fibroblasts, uh, put them at 22 degrees for two hours, kind of a cold shock, uh, run the same DNA repair assay, and we could enhance and joining as well. Uh, so to summarize, what we found by analyzing the whale uh, was that only four hits are required for transformation. Uh, so whale doesn't kill, you know, doesn't induce apoptosis so easily like what was found in the elephant. Uh, but instead, uh, it chose uh, to upregulate genome maintenance through overexpression of cold-induced RNA binding protein. And this is its, you know, maybe, um, more, you know, conservative way of uh, uh, avoiding cancer instead of, you know, evolving some elaborate ways to kill cells or induce senescence. Let's just not accumulate mutations in the first place. And this parallels our earlier findings 
Uh, so we published a study uh, two years ago where we compared double stand break repair efficiency across multiple species with different lifespans, and we found very strong correlation again with the double stand break repair pathway that it is enhanced in longer lived species, maybe in part uh, to avoid cancer because this type of mutations uh, would be very detrimental. So why care protein was enhanced in whale and not in other species? Well, probably because they live in the cold. Uh, and we humans didn't evolve to live in this cold water, so this is more human environment. Uh, this is why you know, we can potentially benefit from this. So there are many folk remedies that uh, you know, involve uh, cold plunge or cold showers. And that there are different explanations for why it's good for you, but here we can perhaps add one more, that if it induces your curb, it may be enhancing DNA repair. And now this is my last slide, so what I would like to uh, end with is, you know, just to show you again this strategy where we can learn uh, from nature uh, different novel mechanisms uh, to for cancer resistance and longevity. So we talked about uh, bowhead whale today and naked mole rat. We also study other species here. We study blind mole rat. I didn't have time to talk about it, and bats. Uh, and once we understand the mechanisms responsible for cancer resistance in these species, we can generate mouse models as proof of principle that this strategy can be translated. Uh, and then we generate uh, various pharmacological interventions that um, can recreate the same milieu, and these then can be applied to human patients. Uh, so I would like to thank members of my group. So here is all our lab just a few weeks ago at the conference in Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, I was naming people as I was going along. All this work was done also in collaboration with Andrei Shiluanov, uh, my lifetime collaborator. And we have positions available, so if you are interested in uh, working on long-lived animals, you are welcome to contact me. And we have many external collaborators, and I would also like to thank our funding sources.